Sure. All yours. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here today. So I'm Elliot Krieger from U of T and Vector Institute. And the topic today is methods for counterfactual data augmentation in reinforcement learning. So um, let me just start off with some gratitude. This is a very much a collaborative effort to the work that I'm going to discuss today. Um, I think it's especially uh, <laughs> relevant to acknowledge Sylvia Pittis, who is really driving the, the projects here. Um, so I was very fortunate to work alongside him. And if you're interested in reading the papers or, or viewing the code, there's uh, links to do that. Um, okay, good. So, so this is a talk um, mostly about reinforcement learning. Um, it might be helpful for me to understand, and it's, you know, by the way, it's great to see all of your faces. I, if you keep your cameras on, I'll stay engaged with you and, and that'll be great. But maybe just show of hands, are people familiar with reinforcement learning? Who, who has done like research in this area before in RL? Okay, I think I'm counting zero hands. Um, how about like read a reinforcement learning paper before? Okay, some more hands. Okay, great. So, um, so the good news here is that you do not need to understand how reinforcement learning algorithms work to understand the insights from the paper. And that's because what we're going to do is a pre-processing stage on the data set before any of the reinforcement learning happens. So we are very much agent agnostic, whatever your favorite algorithm is, um, you can run it on, on our stuff. But I'll just kind of set the table here so that you at least have a bit of context for what we're talking about. So. In reinforcement learning, it's different um, from supervised or unsupervised learning, most notably because we think about deploying our model in a dynamically changing environment, okay? So the model is usually called the agent, and the agent contains a policy, um, usually denoted by pi. It is a mapping from states you observe to actions you might take, right? And this feedback loop picture is very important, okay? So the agent is observing a state, mapping that to an action, and those actions will change the environment in which the agent is embedded. So as a consequence, the observed state you see in the future is going to change. And how is the agent going to learn? Well, it's going to learn based on an instantaneous reward signal, okay? Um, so we're really talking about a data-driven way of doing sequential decision-making. Of course, there's many other ways to do sequential decision-making. RL is super related to control theory and other methods that are a little bit uh, less focused on learning algorithms. But it's a very expressive framework that is suitable even if you don't have a good model for the dynamics of this environment. Okay. So what we typically do is use dynamic programming. We're really interested in maximizing the long-term expected reward. So we're gonna sum up the rewards we expect to see in the future, and then use dynamic programming to break that long sum into single time step chunks. And we're gonna use uh, the power of dynamic programming to derive learning algorithms that are suitable for this type of objective. So we might be interested in things like a value function. Um, in this instance, we have a value for a given a policy pi, I guess the font's a little bit small, sorry about that. And it's evaluated at a particular state. And really what, what does it mean to have a scalar value at a particular state for a particular policy? Well, what that means is you imagine rolling out the policy in the environment, starting at the initial state here, and then you would tally up in expectations, so there's some randomness here, but you're tallying up the discounted rewards that you see on all your future time steps. Um, so that's kind of what we'd like to do. And like I said, we use dynamic programming to break this huge sum into kind of uh, bite-sized components, let's say. Um, so this is one example of a type of reinforcement learning called policy evaluation, where you start off with a policy function pi, and your goal is to learn the true value for pi at every state in the system. The details are not super important. It's just to show you the, the kind of dynamic programming flavor. 
So what you would typically do is iterate on this algorithm and over time, that's going to give you the true values at every state. This is a simple grid world uh, sort of system where an agent can be in you know, any one of these grid spots. It can move to adjacent squares and ultimately it's hoping to land in one of these two goal areas, okay? Um, and this iterative process basically takes a random policy pi and over time computes the true values, which are represented by this kind of infinite sum, um, but we've done it in a kind of computationally efficient way. Um, and so what one other thing to know is once you have a value function for a particular policy, there's a very nice result that says, if you act in a greedy way, according to that value function, um, you can actually do better than what the policy would do in that environment. So really the value is kind of saying, how good is this policy gonna do on average? Well, you can take those averages and you can actually do better than them by acting in a greedy way. And so in this case, we're ending up with V of pi here, but we can back out an optimal policy pi star. Um, and that's basically what reinforcement learning is due. There's some, there's some very nice uh, convergence guarantees that say things like, you know, you're going to, these kind of processes, I'll, I'll skip over the details, I'll wave my hands a little bit, but these kinds of processes will converge to optimal policies in the long run, eventually, if you run enough iterations. That's very powerful. But there's an important caveat here, which is that the convergence to optimal policies is only covered, is only guaranteed if all of my states are covered. So for example, I need my policy to go around and uh, visit every one of these states in this grid world. Otherwise, there's no guarantee I'm gonna converge. So that's really what today's topic is about. Everything I said just now about reinforcement learning is not super important. So if that felt like a lot of jargon to you, that's fine. Just like wipe the slate clean. We're gonna be talking about data and sort of coverage over um, probability distributions. Uh, but I just wanted to motivate the problem here. So as the number of states increases, it's going to be increasingly hard for us to provide the type of coverage that give us theoretical guarantees. So we're typically in practical situations, kind of like crossing our fingers and hoping that the reinforcement learning algorithm converges to a nice policy, but there's no guarantee, okay? And, you know, so... You know, what I'm here to talk about today is more practical applications of RL that are uh, severely data constrained. So I'd like you to think about deploying a robot arm in a factory, for example. Um, well, we're not going to be able to collect data from all states by just deploying an exploratory policy because that could uh, cause some safety concerns for the workers that are working alongside the robot. Um, another instance you might be interested in is using reinforcement learning to help physicians um, develop treatments for uh, patients in a clinical machine learning uh, setting. Now, if you think about the data you can collect from the clinic, every patient is going to have their own unique health story. So you'd have a patient, they're getting treatments at different times, their kind of health is progressing over time, there's some outcome. Maybe they're discharged from the hospital. Hopefully they uh, you know, don't have any adverse health outcomes, but you could observe those if they do happen. But very crucially, all of these outcomes that you didn't observe, these counterfactual outcomes are just fundamentally missing from the data. And it is not ethical for us to give random treatments in order to get coverage over all of these possible states, right? So our goal here is going to be to augment past experience and tackle missing data problems. So that's kind of the goal where we're heading. And I'll just give you a sense for what the scope is here. Um, and like I mentioned, the details of how reinforcement learning works is not super important for the purposes of this talk. But I would like you to understand that um, the learning process can be fairly involved and there's lots of different pl places along that pipeline that we could think about making improvements. So typically we have our agent interacting with the world, that's going to create some data set. We would call this typically the replay buffer or experience buffer. So you might hear me use those words interchangeably. And then once we have a data set, um, which contains like long 
trajectory of agent behavior, we're actually going to shuffle it up and sample single time step transitions. So trajectories are kind of sequences of transitions. And the dynamic programming aspect is saying, I'm going to shuffle all of those experiences up and just sam sample those single time step transitions. And my agent will consume those. And eventually it will learn how to act optimally in the, in the environment. And of course, you know, what do you do with that data? Well, you might want to update your value functions. Before we had value functions that looked like V sub pi of S. Here we have Q. The pi is kind of left implicit, but it's it's really a dependency there. There's just different type of value functions, but that's what's happening in the update rule. You can use your values to update the policies. We saw an example of that before. And once you have a new policy, you may want to deploy that in the environment and collect a fresh batch of data. So there's a lot of kind of feedback loops happening here. Um, people who do uh, research on this topic can look at a lot of different aspects of the problem in order to make uh, progress. But today we're going to be talking about the role of the replay buffer itself. So we are going to be asking questions like, where does this batch of data come from and can we use it more efficiently? Okay. And specifically, we're going to be doing that through a data augmentation uh, perspective. Uh, any questions so far? This is just kind of the motivation, so I want to make sure I'm not losing people. I see a thumbs up. That's very great visual feedback. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, okay, good. So, so here's the outline for the rest of the talk, and the nice thing is that we've already covered the motivation here. Um, the meat of the talk is going to be this section on causal priors for sequential decision making, where I'm going to present some of my work on frameworks for counterfactual data augmentation. And that's where we're going to be diving deep into methods. But at the end, I'll come back and discuss how does this relate to algorithmic fairness? That's really closer to the type of topics that you're discussing in this reading group. So I think it's appropriate for me to acknowledge the connections there. And I'll be talking about some methods. So how can we use fair machine learning to help us with causal inference? And the other direction, how can we use causal inference to help uh, with fair machine learning. And the last thing I want to discuss, and um, I think it is important to get to this, so we'll see how the, the time is, but I may skip ahead to this if I need to, is some limitations and critiques. So there's been some really noteworthy um, criticisms of how machine learning people and computer scientists are using uh, causal, uh, different methods from causality to tackle societal problems. Um, and this is something that I've grappled with a little bit at my work, so I'll share some of my thoughts on that. Okay, so let's move into this portion of the talk, counterfactual data augmentation. So before we talk about counterfactual data augmentation, let's start by talking about data augmentation in reinforcement learning. So this is kind of a similar story if you know how data augmentation is used in um, in supervised learning and unsupervised learning, weekly supervised learning, you will know that it's a good idea to use data augmentation if you have a good augmentation scheme for the problem that you care about. It just tends to help. So that's exactly what we see in reinforcement learning where data augmentation can really give you uh, huge sample efficiency wins. Um, I guess it's worth just briefly noting in, in reinforcement learning, we do care about absolute performance, but we often care just as much about sample efficiency because our learning algorithms tend to take a lot of uh, interactions with the environment to converge to a good solution. So we do care about how fast the learning uh, progresses and data augmentation can really help us with that. So one example is called hindsight experience replay. Um, I'll tend to call it goal relabeling. It works like this. So first of all, it's designed for a goal conditioned reinforcement learning setting. So we're going from our policy uh, being a mapping from states to actions to now our policy being a mapping from states and goals to actions. So every policy has a particular goal in mind. And in this instance, our robot arm is trying to uh, grab this puck and move it over to a specific goal area. So the goal is kind of a two-dimensional endpoint where you'd like to, to leave the puck. And in this particular instance, the arm has moved the puck over to this area. Its goal was over here, 
So we can say that the arm failed in this experience to reach the goal. Um, hindsight experience replay is about, in a way, reframing that experience and saying, okay, you didn't achieve your goal, you failed. However, now that you've collected that data, if I go back and imagine that you were actually trying to get the puck here, this if this were your goal, then you would have succeeded. So I'm going to take that experience and relabel the value of the goal everywhere in my experience and uh, feed that to my agent and help. And that actually can really help. So that's going to give me a huge win in this kind of uh, goal condition space, which is very large space to work in because there's many possible goals. Um, another type of data augmentation is visual data augmentation. Uh, this is appropriate for settings where we are learning from images. We don't directly observe the positions and velocities of, of the objects that we uh, are wanting to manipulate. Instead, we observe images of them. And we need to sort of learn a representation of what is the useful state variables and then learn to act based on that representation. Um, and what we can do is add random rotations and, and cutouts, and that tends to give us a nice sample efficiency win as well. Um, by the way, for the rest of the talk, I won't be discussing cases where we deal with images. It'll all be this uh, slightly simpler setting where we directly observe the relevant state variables for every object we want to interact with. Um, but you know, really the key insight for this talk, if you don't get anything um, else for the talk, I'd like you to, to take this away, is that these types of data augmentation schemes, they might seem dissimilar at first, but they actually are both exploiting a type of independence. Implicitly, there's a notion of causality. And these data augmentation schemes are using counterfactual reasoning to generate new and valid counterfactual data. So let's be explicit about that causality. So like I said before, reinforcement learning is all about dynamic programming. So we're taking our huge long trajectory of experience and we're slicing it up into single time step transitions. So in terms of the causal model, we really only need to consider single time step transitions. Um, here's an example of a, a graph over, over such a transition. We have our states, we have our actions, and these are causing the next states. And the argument here is to say that the goal is independent of the state action dynamics. So certainly it is the case that my policy was goal dependent, right? Because I had a, a dependency on the goal here. However, once I go and collect that data, the policy is not acting uh, online anymore. So at this point, in that data, the observed data, all the actions are fixed. So when I condition on the action, that actually breaks the influence of the goal on the next state. In the same way that you'd have in a probabilistic graphical model, you now have independence of this part of the graph with the rest of the graph. And so that's what justifies us going back into the data and labeling the goals, okay? Similarly for visual data augmentation, we can imagine that there are some underlying physical features which we do not directly observe. What we do observe are visual uh, projections, let's say, of those physical features. And if I were to randomly rotate those or you know, add some noise or whatever onto those pixels, it's not going to change the underlying physical dynamics. Um, so this view of what is going on with data augmentation suggests there may be a recipe for generic counterfactual data augmentation or CODA. And that recipe is simply that you look over your single step transition dynamics, you try to identify independent causal mechanisms. And if you're able to do that, then that you're going to be able to go back into your experience of relabeling the values for one of those mechanisms and have the other mechanism uh, take its original values. Um, any questions so far? So, so next I'd like to um, just really develop this intuition using a very simple example. Here is a game of pool where we have uh, two billiards balls. They're kind of going around the screen, bouncing off things. 
And for the most part, these balls behave independently. And that's what allows us to, uh, to use CODA, right? But, um, oh, right, so, so what does that mean? So, um, so what that means is I'm gonna look over my prior experience on the top row here, and maybe I can grab the orange trajectory from this experience and pair it with the blue trajectory from this experience to create a totally new trajectory. I've never seen this in my data set before, but if I look at it, it seems plausible and maybe feeding this trajectory to the learning agent could be helpful, okay? Um, so that is promising, but we should keep in mind that if we insist that the balls are always independent, we're gonna run into trouble. Right. So if I were to combine the blue ball from this experience along with the orange ball, this experience, I will create some new data, but it doesn't seem plausible. Right. The, the balls are passing through each other without any collisions. So this is, you know, a bit problematic. And, and really what we're looking for is a way to resolve this. We would like a principled rejection sampling scheme that will allow us to keep only the data that looks reasonable and um, discard any other possible augmentations. Um, so here's where we can get a little bit formal. And so I'll propose a, a new way of, uh, of modeling a transition dynamics called local causal models. It is a variant of uh, structural causal models or SCMs. Um, that's a very popular graphical way of, um, of modeling various uh, systems due to Udipurl. Uh, so if you've seen causal graphs before, you might be interested in some of these kind of like formal expressions. And if you haven't seen them before, it's really, you don't need to worry about the formalism, just the intuition is the most important part. And the intuition goes like this. Okay, so we're interested in building a model of single step transitions for the problem that we're looking at, This. A pool example. Now, in expectation over everything that could happen in that pool game, we would actually need a dense connection structure in these edges because the balls could eventually collide with one another, right? So if I think about probability of orange ball conditioned on, you know, probability of orange ball conditioned on whatever happened before the parents in the causal graph, I do indeed need to keep these edges, right? However, if I can condition on a subspace of all of the states, let's define that, for example, as the set of states where the balls are physically separated. In that case, I can define a new causal model or an LCM, a local causal model, that behaves exactly the same as the global causal model, specifically on this subspa uh, subspace, right? And if you're outside of the subspace, you simply do not use this LCM. But once you're in that subspace, Things look exactly the same from a sort of density perspective. However, we're we're now able to remove um, the, the kind of dense uh, connections in our graph. And so that's going to give us exactly what I said we're looking for, a principled rejection sampling scheme. And it works like this, very simple case logic. So we are going to look and see for the source data that we start off with and the augmented data that we could be adding to our experience buffer, we're simply going to check, are all of those samples within the local subspace, right? Um, if they are, as in, in this case, then we're going to accept that sample. And if any of them fall outside of the local subspace, we say the LCM does not apply here. We are just not going to add this to our experience buffer. Um, so in the bottom, uh, you know, we have instances where the balls are falling outside of the local subspace because the balls are going close to each other. So we're going to reject that sample. Um, and that's really what's going on in CODA. Um, now, LCMs, these local causal models, can also be built for more sophisticated dynamic uh, settings, such as Markov decision processes, um, which are more suitable for applications in RL. Uh, maybe in robotics, for example, you might have a two armed robot that's manipulating different objects in the scene. Uh, most of the time, the arms are apart, right? So that means that they're acting independently. If I want to guess the position of the left arm, I'm only depending on previous states along that left arm. I don't need to consider the right arm. However, as soon as the 
uh, arms kind of grab the same object, they induce a mechanical coupling, right? So at that point, I need these these dense um, these dense edges. Uh, good. Any questions so far about the the framework? So, um, so where do local causal models come from? Well, so far I've just given you examples of LCMs being defined using domain knowledge. Um, right. So if my LCM is defined in terms of the balls being physically separated, I could code that up. It's a, just a few lines of Python code. All I'm doing is looking at the current state of each ball, drawing a sort of a threshold radius around it, and just double checking that those don't overlap. Right? Um, I do want to mention, although I won't go into details here, that these LCMs can also be learned directly from data, and that's something that we've had a bit of success doing, although it's a hard problem in general. So this is a really important area of future work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just briefly how this works, um, as an example, would be you train a, uh, a, a, tr a model on those single step transitions, a generative model, to do next state prediction. And um, in this instance, we use a uh, permutation invariant flavor of a transformer where the attention masks are sort of suitable for handling objects interacting with one another. We train it up to predict the next state given the previous state and the action. Um, this is a setting very similar to billiards where these objects are just bouncing around and potentially colliding with each other. And what we see is that most of the time, um, you know, if I go and look at the internal activations, the attention masks within my trained dynamics model, if I want to predict the next state for shape one, which is over here, I really only need to consider the features from state one at the previous time step. Okay. Now, in this instance, uh, one got a little bit closer to shape three and then they're about to collide. My dynamics model knows about collisions because it was trained to, uh, to predict next states. So in order to predict the next uh, state for shape one, I need to consider the features at shape one and the features at shape three. So we can kind of back out an LCM directly from the learned uh, transition model. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about some results here. Um, so as I mentioned at the at the offset, you should really think about CODA as a data pre-processing stage. It's completely agnostic to the type of reinforcement learning you want to do downstream. Um, in this instance, I'm trying to solve uh, a pawn game. Basically, I'm trying to, it's sort of like there's not two players. There's one player and the player is just trying to keep the ball going between the two pedals. Um, and I'm training it totally using offline data. So I collected a bunch of data. Now I want to use that data without collecting any fresh samples to train an agent to do this task. That's the problem with offline reinforcement learning. And what I have here is a baseline model that is trained at various different uh, data budgets, right? So this is like 50,000 seconds of data. And what you can see is the more data, the better, right? We're improving um, with the data budget. And when we add counterfactual data on top of the real data, say at a ratio of three to one, that actually gives us a performance boost. And the boost in performance is what we would typically associate with a doubling of the data budget. So here, Coda has made the experience buffer four times as big. The performance win is, is sort of two times. So you have to pay a little bit more, but crucially, you can you know, generate these counterfactuals without having to interact with the environment. Um, so yeah, Helen, is there a question? Oh yeah, so um, I'm just asking, is there a scenario that CODA will fail? Or for instance, does it uh, mainly used for like, like the data augmentation specifically in reinforcement learning? Like for instance, in other scenarios? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a good question. So um, let me first try to answer that question by just re- uh, stating what the kind of scope is here, okay? So the problems that we're looking at here are reinforcement learning problems where objects, the interaction of the agent with different objects is kind of the key to solving the task. We're also assuming that we directly observe the state variables for every object that's relevant. And this is an MDP, not a partially observable MDP. So everything about the problem we are observing 
Um, and there's one more assumption, which is that we have an LCM. So that's the crucial inductive bias here. We are using causal prior information. I told you it can be learned from data, but um, I think most often it would be specified by a domain expert. And we're using that causal prior to help us solve the problem more efficiently. So in a way, it's very similar to uh, standard data augmentation where we have in images, you know, blurring and sure. things that we think the, the method should be invariant to. Um, in this case, it's tied to the causal model. So it's there's more of a causal inference interpretation. In terms of how this would fail, well, if any of those things were not true, it's not clear um, what will happen. In this, uh, very shortly, I'll get to an extension of Coda that's about generating out of distribution states. And I argue that um, Coda is really a way of giving you interpolation over your distribution. And sometimes you need extrapolation to generate things you've never seen before. And that can be hard to do regular Coda. Um, if you get the LCM wrong, it could badly, but actually we find that um, oftentimes Coda is remarkably insensitive to misspecifications of the LCM, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the problems that we've studied. Does that answer your question? At yeah, the end, sense. we can talk about how would you do Coda in a completely different situation like prediction um, mm -hmm. or recommenders? And I haven't thought through this carefully, but I definitely think the the general principle could be uh, applied. And that general principle is if I have domain knowledge about the causality, yeah. then I should be able to derive data augmentation that could help me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for answering. Yeah, of course, like I know this group deals with information retrieval and recommender systems. And these are other instances where we have uh, these data constraints. Like we just we have a lot of, of uh, missing data coverage and you know we can't recommend random things to people all the time. So um, maybe that's something we can discuss at the end. So I guess the long and short of it is that Coda is helpful, right? This is the results slide. You're just supposed to see that it's good, but I do appreciate Helen's question. It's not uh, general, generally good for everything. Um, and we can apply it to more sophisticated continuous control problems. I'm just gonna skip over the details here. I think you get the main point here, right? So results slide, my method is, is good, right? So, um, so, so that's Coda and, you know, I, another way to think about what's happening here is we kind of have this equation, right? Where we're taking different experiences and sticking them together to get new data. That's really a type of implicit generative model, okay? So we're not being a parameterized generative model, but we're like stitching together experiences that we've seen to sample fresh data, okay? And um, as I just briefly mentioned, you can think of this as kind of an interpolation over the support of the training data you already have. But there may be instances where interpolation is insufficient and we really need extrapolation. So the next part of the talk is about how would you uh, rethink CODA in order to gen um, produce relevant out of distribution states. And the way to do that, unfortunately, you can't continue with this idea of implicit generative modeling, you have to introduce explicit parameterized generative models over the transition dynamics. Um, and that's the focus of the next paper, which is called a model-based coda or no coda. Good. <clears throat> so uh, here is a sort of motivating problem for why out of distribution states are needed in some RL settings. Uh, here, I am attempting to use offline data that's been collected before. I can't collect any fresh data to do the RL. That data was collected from a source task, okay? And I like to use it to solve a related but distinct target task. So there's a notion of transfer learning here. We're doing offline reinforcement learning. The source task has one of uh, two flavors, okay? Either we are taking this uh, hook here and using it to grab the red block and bring it over to the red goal area, or we're grabbing the yellow block 
and bringing it over to the yellow goal area. So those experiences are the things I've seen so far. <clears throat> I'd like to use those experiences to learn how to hook both blocks at the same time and bring them to the same goal area. And this is difficult because we are fundamentally missing data, zero data for some crucial uh, areas of the state space. Um, in particular, here is a histogram where I plot every instance in the source data where I saw the red and yellow block nearby to each other. And what I find is that I do see these blocks nearby to one another, but that tends to happen at the beginning of episodes before the hook drags one of those blocks away, okay? But that's a problem for me because my task here is to grab both blocks and bring them over to the goal area. But I've never seen what it looks like for red and yellow blocks to be together close to the goal area. So this is very important to understand. Reinforcement learning just fundamentally cannot learn how to do optimal control in this situation. It needs at least a few examples of successful behavior. So there's a lot of trial and error in reinforcement learning. And part of that is because we need to cover all of the states that are relevant to solving the problem. So just in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna sort of breeze through this part of the talk on MoCoda, and if you're interested afterwards, take a look at the paper, feel free to email me. Um, you may remember in Coda that we had the LCM, and when data fell into the subspace, we were able to augment it. When it fell outside of that subspace, we did nothing. In MoCoda, what we're going to do is build parameterized generative models for every local subspace. And that's going to allow us to do augmentation in every instance which is important because it allows us to handle cases where there are object collisions or objects are interacting somehow. Now, again, just very briefly to give you a sense of what's happening here, the key insight is to look at the single step transitions and factorize the joint distribution over all of the random variables in an object oriented way. So we're gonna look at a marginal distribution over all of the very all of the objects. Okay, that's like our our factor here, and we're also going to have an a causal mechanism for each of this uh, object dynamics on its own. Okay, we're not saying the objects have to be independent, right? Because you know this object could have two causal parents. Like it could depend on what happened with the other object. Um, but the it is really important that every uh, object have its own causal mechanism here and that we have a marginal distribution over all of the objects together. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to learn the parameters of this generative model. Once it is well trained, we are going to keep these as they are, the causal mechanisms that are object specific. And we are going to make alterations on the parent distribution, the sort of marginal distribution over how all of the objects um, this is, doesn't have to do with the dynamics. It's, just, it's more like occupancy. It's more like, where am I seeing these objects? There could be correlation patterns here, but we want to improve the support over that marginal distribution. So we're starting off with a parent distribution. And what we're looking for is a modified parent distribution queue. So my parent distribution could be something like this. Uh, it's a joint distribution over two objects, clearly missing some support. But if I marginalize out either dimension, I end up with a marginal distribution over each of the two objects, okay? So what I'm looking for is increasing my support over this marginal distribution. And I can do that through maximizing the entropy of Q. There's gonna be a constraint on this maximization, which says whatever distribution I, um, I arrive at uh, here, I need it to match the marginals, right? So if I marginalize this distribution, it needs to give me the same as the, the marginal I started off with. If you're interested, you can take a look at the paper. There's actually some things sort of theoretically we can say about if you generate data in this way, you sample states from this distribution and then you push them through these causal mechanisms that are object specific, these causal mechanisms will provably generalize. Even though the mechanism is seeing data it never saw in its training data, in its training corpus, it's still able, sorry, it's still able to predict with low approximation error what the next states are going to be. So I'll just leave things there. That's the idea of MoCoda. It's a little bit involved. The key idea, again, is 
Um, you have a bit of domain knowledge that says how we think the causal mechanisms are or objects are interacting. We use that to, in this case, generate out of distribution states. Um, and we can see in this instance, we're able to generate some states that are crucial to solving the task where the red and, and a yellow block are nearby to one another and close to the goal state. Um, and just like with the results slide that I showed before, we can see that this can, can really help. Um, if I just try to solve this task with the empirical data alone, I simply cannot make any progress. Um, just like with Mo uh, sorry, just like with the original Coda, Mo Coda is agent agnostic, right? You can use it with whatever sort of offline reinforcement learning uh, algorithm you like. Okay, any questions on that? I'm just wrapping up the kind of Coda part of the talk here. Okay, good. So a few directions for future work, and then we'll talk about connections to fairness. So we really need better ways of inferring local independence. So this is very related to um, causal discovery. We also need ways of scaling this uh, method up, right? So everything so far has been working with states of the objects directly that we observe, but we really would like to handle images and videos. So, you know, applying Coda on top of a learned uh, factorization or representation would be very helpful. And there has been some recent work on object-centric representation learning that could be useful in this case. And finally, Coda was designed for RL, but it is not uh, limited to the, to the reinforcement learning setting. Um, if you have good causal priors, you can use those to augment your data in other settings like fair, maybe fair prediction settings, recommenders, uh, robust prediction, and so on. Okay, so let's talk about the connection to algorithmic fairness. I think that this will be useful for the reading group today. Uh, I'll talk about some connections between causality and fairness, and also some concerns or critiques when we apply uh, methods from causality to, to try to solve fairness problems. So perhaps remarkably, I really haven't talked too much about the specifics of causal inference. How do these SCMs, these structural causal models from, uh, from Muta Pearl, how do they operate? Okay, so maybe the group has studied this before. I think it's getting more and more popular, but I just wanna give a 60 second overview. So um, when we collect some data, so here's a simple data set where we have three variables. X represents a, a binary sex of a patient in this case. Um, T represents a treatment, whether they got a drug or no drug. And Y represents a health outcome, positive, they recovered, or negative, they didn't recover. So we can co collect a joint distribution and look at the kind of statistics, conditional probability tables over this data. Um, now, this data exhibits what's called a Simpson paradox, which basically says that, you know, if I were to look at conditional uh, distribution of the health outcome based on the treatment, in this case, it would seem to indicate that the drug is not effective, right? So this is my conditional probability for the combined data. And if I look at these numbers, not having the drug looks um, like 78% recovered. And or sorry, if you, if you have the drug, you recover with 78%. If you don't have the drug, it's 83%. So it looks better if you don't have the drug, okay? However, if I look at a different conditional probability, the outcome conditioned on the treatment and the patient's sex, that trend is exactly reversed. So the, the drug actually looks effective. So this is what's known as Simpson's paradox and begs the question, is the drug effective or not? To resolve the paradox, you need to make a strong statement about how you think, plausibly speaking, the data was generated. If you remember from probabilistic graphical models, that there's this idea of a graph isomorphism. So for the idea with graphs is that they encode conditional independences, but there could be many graphs that encode the same conditional independences. In this instance, what that means is that the edge direction is not fully specified just from the data. There could be six different graphs that do just as good of a job at modeling this data set. And causal inference is really about saying 
I am going to choose a specific graph from that class of isomorphic graphs and say, this is the way the world works. And if my assumptions hold, that allows me to do this type of intervention. I'm calling it LOD generalization. Conference people might not use that language, but really it says, you know, I can access interventional distributions. What would happen if I fix the treatment for everybody in my data set, thus erasing the influence of the patient's sex on the treatment? Okay. And that's going to allow us to resolve this paradox. And in this instance, we can use interventional uh, data to assert the fact that the drug is indeed effective if this is the way the world works, okay? And we can also do counterfactual uh, reasoning, which is sort of a, a little bit different. And it's about saying, I you know, condition on an observed outcome and then I go back and do my intervention. The details are not important, but maybe you've seen this before if you've studied Perl. Uh, and this is kind of evocative. Maybe it suggests that we have some sort of like missing data problem. We can come up with a causal model and then use that to uh, you know, predicts out of distribution. Okay. So how does causal modeling relate to fair machine learning and what sort of lessons can be exchanged between the two areas? Um, so this is, you know, working on this interface, this is something that I've done. Um, and I've done it both ways, okay? So you can use methods from machine learning to actually help with causal inference. In particular, you can use trained generative models over the data set to help improve the estimation of causal effects. What is causal effect estimation? That's exactly the type of question we were asking before. Is this treatment effective in the abstract or globally speaking? Okay. And we were especially interested in cases where we think there is some systemic bias. So the data is confounded in a way that causes fairness concerns. Okay. Now you can go the other way as well. You can use tools from causal modeling to help with fair machine learning. So here's an instance where we took a sort of a fair machine learning paper from elsewhere in the literature. We actually wrote it down as a causal model. And then we run what's called a doubly robust regression model on this causal graph. And it tends to help us find a more fair policy. The details are really not important, but I do want to say that there is some useful kind of interplay here. What I want to discuss instead is maybe some reasons we should be cautious about, um, uh, you know, blindly applying causality to the fairness problems that we are interested in. So I'll, I'll talk to um, through two different critiques. Okay. So remember that the idea with causal inference, especially the Perl style of causal inference is to say, as a computer scientist, as a modeler, as a technologist, um, I'm gonna write down a graph of how I think the world works. And then I'm gonna use that as a prior to generate inferences that I can't directly observe. I'm gonna use that to resolve the confounding in my data. So there is a school of thinking, both from causal inference people and from people outside of uh, statistics and computer science that says, what does it really mean to compute an intervention or a counterfactual on a variable like a sensitive attribute? Okay, these, you know, in principle, causal inference is, is good for questions like effectiveness of drug treatments, but uh, you know, whether you're a protected in, in a protected group or not is not something that you can truly intervene on. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm making this this point clearly, but there's this idea of no causation without manipulation, which is really a critique of the graphical way of doing causality that traces back all the way to uh, Donald Rubin in the 70s. And there's been some sort of more recent uh, critiques along those lines. So, you know, people who do fairness might be interested in counterfactuals saying like, what would happen if I as a loan applicant were in a different protected group? So let's say my race was different. Well, that's not really a well-founded computational question because if I were to be in a different uh, racial group or other protected category, basically every aspect of my life would change. Um, so, 
it's just like sort of an ill-formed question. So that's critique number one. Critique number two is related, but it's really more about the complexity of these systems. And critique number two says, are graphs really expressive enough? Okay. So Lily Hu has this, this nice uh, quip, um, which says, do causal graphs assume a can opener? So to explain what that means, I have to tell you a little joke, it's a joke about uh, economists. And it goes like this. So there's a physicist, a chemist, and an economist on a desert island. Um, they have no food or water, except they do have canned food, okay? So they need to figure out a way to open up those cans to survive. So each of the different professionals takes it a slightly different way. The physicist is going to develop, a, you know, based on the physical properties of the can, a method, a tool to, to get the can open. A chemist is going to look at the chemical properties and figure out a way to loosen the adhesive and get the can open a different way. The economist looks at this problem and says, I need to get that food out of the can. Well, I'll assume a can opener. Okay. So this is a critique of uh, economists who tend to make general statements about very, very simplistic models of global economics, right? It's kind of poking fun at them. Um, but it applies in this case, right? So as computer scientists, we're kind of interested in modeling the social world, but who are we to do that, right? Even if you want to understand something like, um, does being Catholic affect some outcome of a machine learning model? It's really not clear how you disentangle these things. What does it actually mean to be Catholic? Well, there's all these different religious uh, rituals and and sort of protocols that a Catholic might follow. So you could say that being a Catholic causes all of these things. On the other hand, maybe it's the case that a person who follows all of these protocols is uh, causally a Catholic. And there's really, you know, especially when we get to things like, um, like race, for example. So here's a little kind of uh, saying, you know, racism causes race, not the other way around. We need to be really careful as computer scientists, how we write these problems down on the page. It's not the case that people are inherently biologically different, and that is the cause of racial, racial antagonism. Rather, it's the case that these categories, racial categories, are ascribed on people uh, for various complex reasons, essentially to codify different power structures. And that is what, you know, uh, causes uh, there to be disparate impacts in uh, along race and in various different aspects of our society. Okay. So I think there's really an open question of how much mileage we can get out of causal inference. And my sort of general advice is to be be careful. Uh, you know, really try to read outside of your discipline and take these critiques from outside of computer science seriously. And you know, I think the general understanding is if you want some domain knowledge and it's a socially relevant uh, problem setting, you may need other experts who are, you know, trained in social sciences or other ways of modeling social systems, right? Now, there is a, some more recent work that tries to get around this critique essentially by thinking of sensitive attributes not as true causes of the features we, we observe, but instead as kind of reflections of them, like shortcuts that the uh, machine learning system might be picking up on as sort of statistically predictive, but we're not making a strong causal statement about, about what is actually happening. And I think that's uh, potentially a reasonable way forward. Um, just in the interest of time, I won't discuss this, but you can check out the citations if you, if you want to. So we're a few minutes over, I'll just wrap things up. So what did we discuss today? We had motivated the problem of data coverage in reinforcement learning, addressed it through CODA, counterfactual data augmentation, and finally talked about some connections between causal inference and algorithmic fairness, and also some limitations and critiques that we want to keep in mind um, as people working on this from a computer science perspective. Uh, great, so thanks for your time. It was, it was fun to speak with you, and I'm happy to take questions if if people can stick around a few minutes. If not, if you have to go to another meeting, that's fine. Um, so yeah, thank you.